Good morning, church. It is Sunday morning, and we are going to continue talking about the Gospel of Mark this morning. We are uh, going through our annual journey in the life of Jesus. This is something we do because we are a church of Christ. We have always said in our best moments that means that we belong to Christ. It is a description, not a title. And so what better thing to do for a church that belongs to Christ than spend six months out of the year walking through his life with him to remember who we are. And this year we're doing that in the Gospel of Mark. And we're in this uh, early part of his ministry right now. And today we're going to pick up where we left off last week in uh, the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to start in verse 21. And I'm actually not going to read it today because it's a very long text. It's going to go from Mark chapter 1 verse 21 down to uh, verse 17 of Mark chapter 2. And we only have a few minutes, so I want to encourage you to spend some time with it this week. Just take some time to read this. Maybe read it three or four or five times and let it set in. Let it kind of work on you. As a matter of fact, let me challenge you, and I challenged you with this a few weeks ago. If you have an hour and a half, or perhaps you should make an hour and a half, uh, to sit down and read the entire Gospel of Mark in one sitting. Or maybe do that two or three times, or do it once a week and let Mark do his work on you as we go. But today what we're going to find, starting in verse 21 of Mark chapter 1, is a series of healing stories. And what we want to emphasize here is coming out of Jesus' announcement of the gospel, the beginning of his ministry, these healing stories are more than, in Jesus' context, just displays of power. Uh, oftentimes we have cast the healing stories, the miracle stories, as just Jesus with all of these supernatural divine powers doing cool tricks to demonstrate his supernatural and uh, divine nature. But in his context, it would have been much more than that. And so starting in verse 21, I kind of want to illustrate this as we go along, and it's going to kind of summarize in a cool place. It's going to lead us to the next part. Um, Jesus has announced that he is proclaiming the gospel. The kingdom of God is coming. It is time to repent and to believe in the, the good news that the victory of God is coming, that the world is going to and is already being set right through Jesus. And what he does now is he ends up going out into the world, beginning in Capernaum in verse 21, and he's actually going to begin to embody the kingdom. He's actually going to begin to live it out. And everywhere he goes, the kingdom is going to break out. Now, in the Old Testament, the kingdom was described in terms of joy breaking into sorrow, of righteousness breaking into unrighteousness, of justice breaking into unjust, injustice, of, of violence giving way to peace, of healing giving or overtaking brokenness, celebration overtaking mourning, of light breaking into darkness, those sorts of things. And so I want you to pay attention for those tones. As Jesus has told us what he is about, now he's going to show us what he's about. And so in verse 21, uh, they are in Capernaum, they are uh, in a synagogue on the Sabbath, and Jesus begins his ministry by casting out this demon. And it's interesting, and I want you to pay attention, how often in the Gospel of Mark, this is just a side note, but how often in the Gospel of Mark, demons recognize who Jesus is while his disciples do not. It's going to be a theme. It isn't really highlighted here, although... Um, it will be soon enough, so just kind of pay attention to that. But this demon-possessed person comes up to us, comes up to Jesus in verse 24 and begins to, to scream, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. <clears throat> you are the Holy One of God. And as we go down through the story, what Jesus does, and there are plenty of other details that we could pick up on here, but we want to make it through this text, kind of highlighting these miracle stories today. Uh, as we go down through the story... Uh, Jesus, in verse 26 and 25, rather backing up, says, Come out of him, and the demon comes out. And in the moment, it seems like that is just a cool story of Jesus' power. It may even look like Jesus is self-interested. He's not ready to reveal that he's the Messiah yet, and so he silences the demon by casting the demon out. But also, we want to make sure that we put demon exorcism stories in the context of their world because if you are a person who is possessed by a demon that is pretty much the end to your social life and in the ancient world they lived in a context where your social life was what helped you actually live 
It's what helped you actually make it through. They were a communal society. They depended upon one another. They struggled for day-to-day -day existence, and without one another, they couldn't do it. And so to have something like a demon possession would put you outside of the community, outside of the norms of what is acceptable. It would really kind of endanger your life because no one wanted to have anything to do with you. And so here Jesus cast out that demon and in doing that, and the other gospels make this a little clearer. Mark is very brief. He's very concise, but the other gospels kind of make these sorts of stories a little more clear. The demon possessed man now has the opportunity to return to a normal life. The kingdom breaks out in his life. God, who is coming to set things right, casts out the demon, who is the very epitome of what is wrong. And healing, the restoration of dignity, the restoration of community, the ability to be with his friends and, and families and loved ones, the, the opportunity to flourish and thrive, all of that is restored to this man. The kingdom breaks out in his life. From there in verse 29, they uh, go to Simon and Andrew's house or Simon Peter's house and uh, Simon and Andrew in verse 29. And it says that Simon Peter's mother-in-law was in bed and she was sick with fever. This is verse 30. And they told Jesus about her at once and Jesus ends up healing her. And um, it doesn't say a lot here again, but still, in the ancient world, we want to pay attention. Sickness is one of those things where you have to work from day to day for your living. There are things for everyone in the family to do to keep the wheels of life turning on a daily basis. Sickness is the sort of thing that could present a real and lasting danger to the family. Jesus restores this woman who was vulnerable, who was... Um, who was uh, broken by the darkness of our present age, he restores her. From there, Mark just hits us one after another. From there, at sunset, Jesus' ministry begins to spread in verse 32. And people brought to Jesus those who were sick or demon-possessed. The whole town, in verse 33, gathered near the door. He healed many who were sick with all kinds of diseases. And he threw out many demons, but he didn't let the demons speak because they recognized him. Again, there's that note, the demons recognize him. And as we go along, the disciples will not recognize him, even though they spend so much time with him. We want to pay attention to that theme. But hear what is happening here. When Jesus cast out a demon, he was restoring life to that person in ways that are more than just a cool display of power. When he heals someone of their illness, he is restoring life to that person and flourishing in peace and wholeness in ways that are more than just a cool display of power. When he heals someone who is lame, who is crippled, he's giving them the ability to work and to support their family, perhaps, to take care of themselves, to be an active part of community, to care for their neighbor in ways that they were not able to do before. More. If they were reduced to begging, he gives them their dignity. They go from a position of deep shame to a position that is more honorable as they are an active part of the community. Jesus is restoring these things. As news about him spreads, the kingdom begins to break out everywhere. And you can imagine that celebration begins to overtake grief as wholeness begins to overtake brokenness. Righteousness, the way things are, spins out of these unrighteous situations. Jesus is showing us the good news of the gospel. He's showing us about the nature and the character, the flavor of the kingdom of God. This is what it looks like to experience the kingdom of God. Um, and then it says at the end of kind of that sweeping section in verse 38, everyone is looking for him in verse 37 as he goes out into the wilderness to pray early in the morning. But he replies in verse 38, let's head in the other direction to the nearby villages so that I can preach there too. That's why I've come. So he travels in verse 39 throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and throwing out demons. In verse 40, we have another miracle story. A man with a skin disease approached Jesus, fell to his knees and begged, if you want, you can make me clean. And it says in verse 41 that in the face of this man's brokenness, in the face of uh, this man's situation, and uh, with a skin disease, he would have been cast outside the camp. He wouldn't have been allowed in community. He wouldn't have been allowed to touch people or come near people. Anytime anyone came near, he would have to yell unclean, unclean, so that they could avoid him. His life as he knew it was over, he could only survive by the charity of others. He could never hold his son or daughter or hold his wife's hand again 
he comes to Jesus, he says, you can make me clean. And in the face of his suffering, his situation, it says in verse 41 that Jesus is incensed. That Jesus is angry in the face of the brokenness of the world. Jesus is incensed. And this tells us something about who God is and his care and his concern for his world and what he's doing in the kingdom. It says in verse 41, he's incensed and he reaches out his hand and he touches him. And then he says, I do want to be healed or be clean. And it's interesting, there's a reversal here of what's going on in the world. In Jesus' world, if you touch something that was unclean, it made you unclean. But in Mark's story, Jesus, frustrated with the brokenness of the world, reaches out and touches that which is unclean, that which is broken, and it makes it clean. There's this reversal of holiness, this reversal of puritiness where unclean stuff does not defile that which is holy, but holiness stands to purify, to make clean, to mend, to heal that which is broken. There is a lesson for us here. So instantly in verse 42, the skin disease leaves the man and he was clean. We skip down to chapter Two, this is a few days later. Jesus is back in Capernaum. The people heard that he was at home. And a large crowd gathers there. There was no more space, not even near the door. And Jesus was teaching them. And as he was teaching him, there was this man who was paralyzed. And his friends were trying to get him to Jesus. And they couldn't get through the door. So what they do is they crawl up on top of the roof. They would have had flat roofs, just kind of made of mud. And they break a hole in the roof over Jesus' head and lower him down. And based on the determination and the faithfulness and just the tenacity, and maybe we should think about that, the tenacity to love, a tenacious love, a tenacious faith, based on the tenacity of their faith and their love for their friend, Jesus heals this man. Or actually, sorry, I got that backwards. I haven't had enough caffeine this morning. Verse 5, Jesus first forgives his, sin, his sins. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees are there, and they're a little upset that Jesus would do that. Only God can forgive sins. Who do you think you are? And so Jesus, uh, kind of frustrated with them, says, which one is it easier to do? This is the first time, by the way, uh, in this text that we are looking at that Jesus begins to get in trouble with the scribes and the Pharisees. This is a theme that is going to begin to develop quite regularly in uh, Mark's gospel. He says, which is it easier to do for us to, for me to say, uh, your sins are forgiven, or for me to say, rise up and walk? And the answer, of course, in that context would be, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because nobody can tell if it's effective. Nobody can tell if there's anything about it. Any old person can say if they dare to say your sins are forgiven. But to say, rise up and walk is a serious thing. And so Jesus says, so that you know that I have the power to forgive sins, I say to you, rise up and walk. And he lifts them up. And he begins walking. Jesus demonstrates his power. He demonstrates that the uh, love and the grace and the character of goodness of God is working in this situation. You see these miracle stories again and again and again. They're not cool displays of power. They're not just Jesus saying, hey, y'all, watch this. The kingdom of God is breaking out in these stories. And then we come down to verse 13 of Mark chapter 2. And this is my favorite story of the whole bunch. Notice what uh, Mark is doing here. It is miracle story, miracle story, miracle story, miracle story, miracle story. And in the midst of this litany of miracle stories, people are being healed, people are being made whole. And now we come to, without any sort of interruption or any sort of break or any sort of shift in the language, we come down to Jesus going outside and he's teaching, and as he goes along in verse 14 of Mark chapter 2, he sees Levi, Alphaeus' son, sitting at a kiosk for collecting taxes. And Jesus says to him, follow me. And Levi gets up, and he follows him. This is, of course, who we would later call Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew would have been one of the most hated people in his world. He would have been socially ostracized. He likely would have been relatively wealthy, but in that world, wealth does nothing if you don't have honor, if you don't have position. And so he had all these riches, more than likely, but he had no one in his life because he collected taxes for the Romans. He would have been one of the most hated people, again, in his culture. 
And Jesus goes to Matthew and he sees there is a person that I can redeem. And he gives Matthew, he gives Levi the dignity and the respect and the value as a human being created in the image of God that was denied to him by his broader culture that assumed that they were better than him. And I want you to think about this, that in uh, the Gospels, Matthew's calling as a disciple is actually a healing story. Someone who is deeply wounded, someone who is deeply broken, someone who was socially outcast and hated, someone who was perhaps bent beyond recognition by the norms of his culture, he was brought into the center of Jesus' life. He was brought into the middle of this swirling vortex of the kingdom of God breaking out in the darkness of the world. Matthew was made whole. And so Matthew throws a party for Jesus starting in verse 15. The tax collectors and the sinners, they see what is going on. There is something happening here, something that is good. And they come and they celebrate with Jesus. And this will be the norm for Jesus. That those who are least likely to be religious in our way of thinking about things are the ones who resonate most with Jesus. And those who are most likely to be religious in their normal way of thinking about things, they are the ones who objected to Jesus. And sure enough, the Pharisees see Jesus eating with these sinners and not only are they upset that he says that he can forgive sins but now they're upset that he's eating with the wrong sorts of people but in all of this and by the way verse 17 when Jesus heard it he said to the Pharisees why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners healthy people don't need a doctor but sick people do and I didn't come to call the righteous people but sinners and it's funny because in that last statement, there's a lot of irony because the Pharisees would have heard, well, he didn't come to call us because we are righteous people. But um, there's really in this story only two kinds of people. There are those who are sinners and know it, the tax collectors and others who are sitting at the table with Jesus, celebrating the coming of the kingdom of God. And there are those who are sinners and don't know it, who are objecting to what Jesus is doing. But the kingdom of God breaks out everywhere Jesus goes. Joy breaks in, righteousness breaks in, justice breaks in, peace breaks in, healing breaks in, light breaks in, dignity and worth and restoration break in. <clears throat> and what we will find is everywhere the kingdom of God goes, this is the sort of thing that happens. And so there's a challenge here. Mark is writing to Christians. He's asking, do you really know Jesus? Do you really follow Jesus? And the question, of course, is in our life as a church and in our life as individuals, and I'm not suggesting an answer for or against us here, I'm asking you to consider, do these sorts of things break out everywhere we touch the world? How is that happening in the life of our church? How can that happen more in the life of our church? Because everywhere the kingdom goes, goodness and joy and celebration and righteousness and peace break out. All right, I'm going to pray for us because I'm almost out of time. And um, I'm going to leave you to recite the greatest commands with your family where you are. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for revealing yourself through us or through him to us. We thank you for your kingdom. And we pray that we would have eyes to see Jesus. We pray that you would give us the courage to follow him. And we come together and we pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. Amen. Church, we love you and we hope that you have a great week. We can't wait to see you again and we look forward to that day. We'll see you soon. Bye.